Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and let me tell you what, I don't know why, but this whole this whole quantum supremacy thing keeps on popping back up. It was popping up a week or two ago, and then it kind of went away, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I see Ivanka Trump tweet about it yesterday. I'm going to show you that in a second. Now, um, I do quantum computing is certainly not my bag. I don't know anything about how all that works and wouldn't even try to begin to understand it. But what I what I do understand is a couple of things. One is this word keeps popping back up in front of me. It's a fascinating topic. And two, I know this just from life experience and that is what you see in the media is not what's really being done. And I've given the example in my life of the, the Patriot missiles. We'd, we'd had no idea that the United States had the capability of shooting missiles down before the Gulf War. And I saw it on CNN on television when I was in high school. And everybody was st sitting there just in amazement watching. We had no idea that the United States could shoot down a missile with another missile. But we saw it unfold right before our eyes, which meant that the U.S. the U.S. had been developing all of this behind the scenes, and what you saw out in public was not a match to what was really going on and what we could really do. Quantum computing will be no different, and that's the reason that this is interesting to me. You 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 can say all you want. Oh, no, this is way off because because that such and such article said so. Well. That's not the way the Manhattan Project worked, was it? The man, the man, and I'll show you that too here in a second. The Manhattan Project was intentionally in secret, and it was also intentionally kept secret from the United States allies because they were worried that if the allies knew that spies of of some of the people that the countries that weren't allies, they might get be able to get access by spying on things that our allies knew. And so they didn't even tell the allies and, and something, look, quantum computing is something as uh, from the, from my understanding, this is something that could be just as important as, or if not more important than, than the nuclear bomb. And so, so it's very naive in my opinion to believe that just what you see is what you get. No, this is something that would be once we're there. Nobody will know it, and all of a sudden, they will know it. And that's the reason this is fascinating to me. So there's all my disclaimers, okay? But Andy Cross sent me this, and this is the Ivanka Trump tweet. America's quantum quest gets an energy boost. And this is an article about, um, it, it was a, I think it was last year that they started this uh, initiative, um, the quantum, what they call it? The Quantum Initiative Act of 2019. Well, this is basically just a, more or less like an update. But then as you go down here, the guy that's writing the article um, said something very interesting. He said, three years ago, I called for a Manhattan Project style effort to make sure America became the dominant quantum power in the 21st century. Well, if a guy in an article said he called for it three years ago, then you can go ahead and write down that the United States in secret was working on something seven years before he said that, because that's the way the world really works. I believe that there's three things that have been in the works as far as like a Manhattan type project. I believe quantum's one of them. I believe what's going on with SpaceX, what's going on in space, including and I'll say it again, including the idea of have, of creating an intergalactic currency and having nodes on the satellites. All these satellites that SpaceX is putting up there, it's about 5G, but it's also about having nodes on these things. And also, the, the, the third is just digital assets. I don't believe that Bitcoin was created by some guy named Satoshi in a bathrobe. I don't believe any of them were. I believe that it was all a plan, and I believe it's all been a Manhattan style project. And I think to, 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 for you, to, especially older people who've been around for a while, for any of you out there, 
who believe that the way the world really works is, oh, well, you see it in Forbes, you see an article in Forbes, and therefore that's where things are. No, that's not not when not when national security, not when there's high stakes. That's not how the world works when the stakes are really high. And the stakes on the, these things, those three things I just mentioned, are very high. And so if you want to believe just what you read, then you keep believing that. But by the time you're 46 like me, then you'll start to come around and, hey, it's not exactly like what they told me. Um, okay, <clears throat> now this, back to the quantum thing, this little tweet popped up here in the last little bit. Let's go through it. Let's make a thread about quantum physics and XRP. Since the last few days, I've been quite interested in quantum physics, which led me to quantum computers. I wanted to know the relationship between them and cryptos. Guess who, which crypto was mentioned? XRP and XLM. Two, the finance industry has many areas where faster and more secure processing are welcome. Using quantum computing would exponentially increase the speed of these transactions. And he's showing a, a Medium article, Quantum Computing, the Future of the Financial Industry. Three, IBM now has 18 quantum computers. Here is their uh, number of quantum systems, 2016 to 2018. Four, Finastra and IBM work together, but who is Finastra? Finastra and IBM form a strategic partnership to accelerate digital transformation of banking with IBM Cloud. All right, there's that. And then number five, Finastra is the third largest fintech company in the world. Finastra was formed through the combination of Mises and D plus H. Six, Ripple and Finastra have teamed up to offer Ripple's blockchain technology through Finastra's payment solutions to support fast cross-border payments. Seven, it seems that the partnership between Ripple and IBM is not official, but there is the, the proof, I guess he means, I found this doc from Mises Finastra and look at page 32. IBM is working with Ripple to add direct access to cross-border payments for non-correspondent banks to its financial transaction manager platform. DNH has integrated Ripple into Global Pay Plus, the global payment services hub offering. CGI has incorporated Ripple into its intelligent gateway solution. Earth, Earthport incorporates the Ripple protocol as a part of its distributed ledger payments hub with API-based integration. All right, let's go to the next one. Eight, and the official partnership is Stellar, IBM Worldwide. We already knew this. Um, look, just by, as a by the way, the backdrop there is space, by the way, Stellar and IBM. Now I can say all that is legit. Stellar partner IBM confirmed to have worked with Ripple. And then he says 10 quantum financial systems already here. It's not, it's just not official yet. Now I'm not saying this folks. What I am telling you is that there's a lot of smoke here. And I think that somewhere at some point we're going to see the fire because this keeps popping up. I'm seeing it from a lot of different directions. You got freaking Ivanka Trump tweeting about it right in the middle of all this talk. I just, you know, how many coincidences are there going to, they're going to be? And then you got this. I went to, this is IBM Q, the IBM, IBM Q network. And I just want to show you both IBM and Google. I know it says, I know for a fact, Google's been working on this since 2014 from what you can see in the video. So there's no telling what they did before then. But look at this. IBM Q network has a community of Fortune 500 companies, academic institutions, startups, and National Research Labs working with IBM to advance quantum computing. And there's their IBM Q, that's uh, the computer. Um, and then you go down here, there's a little video, I'm not gonna show you the whole thing, but look what the video is called. Why do we need quantum computers in the cloud? <clears throat> and by the way, I just wanted to, this is something my, my father actually mentioned. He said, I, he said, you know, I read a lot about the, the quantum computers and he goes, he goes, it's interesting that these quantum computers have to have to operate in very cold temperatures, almost like the kind of temperatures you would have in space. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. Watch part of this. I'm, I won't show the whole thing. Why do we need quantum computers? Classical computers gave us the Internet, smartphones, and even sent humans to the moon. But try asking one to simulate a single molecule like caffeine to understand how it impacts our brains. It's impossible. There's just too much information. Quantum computers may be ideally suited to it. 
By encoding information into quantum states, quantum computers may make calculations that we only dream of today. So we could one day use a quantum computer to finally understand how caffeine's wake-up magic works. IBM is already making quantum computing more accessible than before with open source developer tools called Qiskit and the IBM Q experience, a free way to experiment. It's accessible from virtually anywhere. I'm not going to go further into that one. The more interesting video is Google's demonstrating quantum supremacy. Listen to the second half of this video. So everyone's like, oh, we're screwed because it's just, it's getting really, really bad at large number of qubits. It's like, well, maybe there's some really complex interaction between all the qubits. It turned out that the These reason was rather benign and calibrated right. a little bit better and then it, this problem disappeared. So there wasn't like a, oh, we did it. I think we crossed it, and then it wasn't clear that we crossed it, so we crossed it a little bit further. It took me like a day to realize, like, hold on, you know, this Can't is you actually experimental data. Them? <laughs> it's I kind can't. of amazing to see, you know, how well <laughs> the theory works. The, the processor that achieved a quantum supremacy is called the Sycamore processor. And it's parallel processing two to the 53 states, which is 10 million billion and thus that enormous amount of parallel processing is what gives it the power. When we run a small chunks of the computation in the largest supercomputer in the world, our estimate is that it will take thousands of years to complete the full computation. Technologies are born this way. Let's say the space age started with a satellite space. orbiting Earth, and it was mm. not doing much, it was just beeping. The big technical achievement of quantum supremacy was really dependent on all this young talent who's kind of taken this. Did you notice that he said it, it was dependent? In other words, like it's already happened? <laughs> this video is from October 23rd, 2019, by the way. And gotten it to work. Let's listen to that again. To live. All the processing is what gives it the power. When we run a small chunks of the computation in the largest supercomputer in the world, our estimate is that it will take thousands of years to complete the full computation. Technologies are born this way. Let's say the space age started with a satellite orbiting Earth, and it was not doing much, it was just beeping. The big technical achievement of quantum supremacy was really dependent on all this young talent who's What's kind of been? taken this and got it to work at a very technologically capable level. We have reached a new computational capability. There are certain computations. We have reached a new computational capability. It's the only place in the world where you can compute those things is here in our data center at Google Santa Barbara. For the first time, we're showing that we can solve a problem that is just infeasible to do on the biggest computers ever made by civilization. And what's exciting is now we're ready to turn this over to the world and say, let's figure out. Now we're ready to turn this over to the world. This is October 23rd, 2019. We can do with this. Let's figure out the what thing that excites me most is building a useful quantum computer. When we can give a researcher a tool that is unlike any other and say, great, figure out something cool to do with it. Mankind is pretty good at that. Okay, so I'll say it again. This is not even close to being my field. There are people a lot smarter than me when it comes to talking about anything related to quantum anything. But what I do know is how the world works. And the world works like this. Why was the Manhattan Project kept top secret? The United States did not want Great Britain or France to know that it had nuclear technology. The Allies were afraid that the technology would be stolen by spies belonging to Germany or Japan. This is how the world works, and this is why I say I don't care. It doesn't matter to me what people think where we are because they read an article and they really study this and all that. Even if they know all the ins and outs of how quantum computing works, that's not relevant to me. What's relevant to me is that this is how the world works, and this word keeps popping up in from every angle. And now we've got the President of the United States tweeting out about it, then his daughter's tweeting out about it. All out of out of nowhere. But more important, we know for a fact that Google and IBM have created multiple of these things. And so if, if that's what we're seeing, my question is real simple. What are we not seeing? Just like I didn't see the Patriot missile until it was actually being used, I had no idea this that our country had that kind of capability. What is it 
that we're not seeing? What is it that we're not what is it that we're not seeing having to do with distributed ledger technology, space, and what's going on on those satellites up there and quantum computing? What is it that you're gonna just one day see and all of a sudden you're gonna say to yourself, son of a you know what? That is why it, this is a fascinating topic because I've been around, you know, that's a quote from Sin of Sin of a Woman, one of my favorite movies, Al Pacino. I've been around, you know. Um, Ian Northing sent me this. Um, Monero adds new algorithm to protect uh, anonymity of transactions. Now, this is in response. If you remember, CypherTrace came out a few days ago and said that they um, ha could track Monero transactions now. And so Monero, the developers um, of Monero, they presented the algorithm tr uh, Triptych. Uh, which promises an even greater data protection. In other words, they're trying, I guess they're, they're trying to put out this fire <laughs> and not let people think that they, they can be traced. I would say, I want to repeat to all of you that are listening to my voice. Do not assume that your transactions on any of this stuff are going to be private. You better be paying your taxes and not trying to hide money anywhere in digital assets because you're at some point you're going to get the knock at the door. So do not think for a second that you can get away from paying your taxes. That, that I would be very suspicious of that. XRP Yo-Yo has put out two good videos. Here's one. Uh, it says new update from Christine Lagarde, president of the ECB. In order to reach its full potential, the European Union recovery and resilience facility will need to be firmly rooted in sound structural policies conceived and implemented at the national level. Well-designed structural policies could contribute to a faster, stronger, and more uniform recovery from the crisis, thereby supporting the effectiveness of monetary policy in the euro area. Targeted structural policies are particularly important to rejuvenate our economies with a focus on accelerating investment in priority areas such as the green and the digital transitions. We are now ready. All right. And then he had this one. This is um new update ECB podcast innovation and payments. Benoit Curé talked about the big picture, the role of central banks cross-border in this field. Listen very, very carefully. 103. My first guest today is ECB Executive Board Member Benoit Curé. He's been working closely on these topics as the chair of the G7 Working Group on Stable Coins. Benoit, hi. Let's start by taking a step back and um, thinking about what we're talking about. We're talking about digital money, but what actually is money itself? The way an economist would answer your question is uh, pointing out that money has three functions. A function as a unit of account. That is, you buy, you order a beer, and the beer typically would be uh, like uh, three euros, uh, and that's a unit of account. Well, but it's also a means of payment. That is, you've, you're actually going to pay for the beer, handing out the, the three euros, and uh, it's also a store of value. That is, you will uh, keep euros in case you want a beer tomorrow. Three functions, and these three functions don't have to go all together, and they can be performed by uh, public money as well as private money or any, anything can be used uh, for that purpose, actually. So kids would use uh, marbles or football cards uh, as unit of account, uh, and even a store of value, and that's fine. Now, the point is, if you want to use it across a society, widespread use of money and widespread trust in money, mutual trust in money in a group, uh, requires some uh, political agreement, political understanding, which is why now money is a public undertaking uh, and is supported by laws, constitutions, and is managed by central banks. So local use of money can be private. Public use of money across a society, across an economy, uh, nowadays is uh, public, underpinned by laws, and uh, managed by uh, independent institutions called central banks. And so that's to make sure that all right. thought that was an interesting clip. Now, um, Neil Duncan, um, he said he was inspired to create a best of Brian Brooks video <clears throat> as comp control of the currency. Brian is moving crypto regulations forward faster than anyone else. This video shows his aggressive narrative for crypto's bright future. Now, I'm not going to play you a lot of this, but I wanted you to all go and give Neil Duncan a subscribe here because 
Brian Brooks, I believe, is one of the, the key characters in this whole game. In everything that's happening right now, I believe Brian Brooks, when the history books are written, not only is he, is he very sharp, but the guy is like a gunslinger. He's kind of like, here it comes. Uh, this is what we're doing. This is the right thing to do. He's, he's kind of no holds barred. I enjoy every move he's making. I'll just play you just the first part of this, just so you can kind of hear him if you haven't before. The acting U.S. Comptroller of the Currency joins us now. Brian, fantastic to have you with us. I'm really excited to, um, to have you on. You sort of have a 21st century view of what the banking sector should look like. And uh, I said it's raising a few eyebrows. It's raising a few more. Give me a sense of what your vision is. Well, Julia, thanks for so much for having me. And these are really important questions to ask in a time like this. You know, this is a time when Americans are depending on their banking system more than they ever have before. When we made a decision collectively in this country to shut down the economy very broadly back in March, we depended on the banks to deliver benefit payments in the form of paycheck protection uh, program uh, loans and checks sent from the Treasury Department. And the problem is we were sending those across 19th century banking rails. Many people said that it took days or sometimes weeks to receive their payments. And my vision is that we need to get to a place in this country where payments can be transmitted virtually instantaneously, where errors can be eliminated and it turns out technology exists today that can help us do that so we need to get mm, wonder what that is <clears throat> okay i'm not going to show you any more of that i just want to show you that xrp bart sent me this he says they know amazon accelerate um and he's highlighted this gain insights to prepare for and adapt to changes in the digital economy they all know it's coming folks now i trust capital put out an article that is very interesting now this has, I don't care what your political leanings are. I'm going to show you the numbers behind this right here so that you at least are aware and can prepare. He's talking about, this is talking about Biden's proposed tax plan. It would double the tax rate on large investment gains. Now I want you to see this part right here. If Biden's plan were to be passed, and again, this is not, I'm not weighing in politically on this. I'm just telling, I'm just showing you the numbers and, and how you need to be thinking about them. If Biden's plan were to be passed, both would change. First, the top income uh, bracket would go from 37% to 39.6. Second, and more painful for crypto investors, if we see another bull cycle like 2017, long-term capital gains would be taxed at the same rate as income tax for households making over a million dollars per year. The top rate would go from 20% to 39.6%, nearly a 100% increase. And don't forget, if you live in a state that has an income tax, go ahead and add that on as well. So for those states like California, New York, Illinois, and many others, you will pay an additional 6 to 13%. Now, these guys lay out for you how this affects you. They give you an example here. Think this won't affect you? Think again. For those investing in cryptocurrency, all we have to do is go back a few years to the previous bull market cycle that peaked in 2017, 2018. We saw numerous crypto assets increase by several, several thousand per, percent. And they give you an example. You turn, let's say you turn $25,000 investment into 2.5 million. Under the Biden plan, even if you hold your position for over a year before liquidating, you would owe, you would owe 39.6% federal taxes on your gains over a million dollars. That's $594,000 on, on the additional 1.5 million versus 300,000, which is the today's 20% at today's rates. In other words, you're paying 594000 in taxes instead of 300000 under his plan. I'm not telling you that to, to tell you to be anti-Biden. That's not why I'm telling you. I'm just telling you the fact it, to be prepared for this kind of a tax rate, okay? That's why I have my iTrust Capital Roth IRA. And, and if you, if you haven't thought about this or done anything like this, go in the description of my videos. I've got a link to iTrust Capital and a one month free coupon in there. Uh, this is the way to go. I mean, there's no telling the crazy gains that could be had when this finally all really does go off. And so why pay a 39.6 or even a 20% tax rate in my Roth IRA inside of there? I'm not. <laughs> I can buy and sell out of it all day long and don't incur any tax. Um, it's a huge deal. All right. 
Now, uh, I wanted to show you this. I don't like saying it. This is this is an RT article. I don't like saying it, but something will replace the U.S. dollar. Investor Jim Rogers says century of USD reign is ending. No, I just wanted to read a couple of his quotes from this. I'm an American, so I don't really like saying it, but I'm afraid the U.S. dollar is coming to its century or so, uh, or so of dominance and something else will replace it. Uh, and then he goes on down here. If Washington gets angry at you, it puts sanctions on you. That hurts everybody. So the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Brazilians, and other countries are start, starting to look for an alternative competing currency to the U.S. dollar. Now, those of you that live in America, you you may or may not realize that the, the U.S. dollar being the world reserve currency for all these years is what has provided you your standard of living. If that changes, your life changes. Um, and, and like I've said, I believe the United States has had a plan to transition to, to the, to a new system for a long time to protect you and I. Um, now this was disturbing. So I wanted to show it to you from Zero Hedge. China parties like it's night, like it's 2019 as patrons pack pool parties, nightclubs and bars from Wuhan to Beijing. I don't know what the story is, folks, but there is a story right here. <laughs> I don't, this is disturbing to me when I see that because I'm being forced to wear a freaking mask in a restaurant in the United States right now. I can't even walk out of the house without wearing a mask and my kids are going to have to go to school and wear a mask. I want to know why they're not having to wear masks when they, that's where this thing came from. I want to know the answer to that. And I believe there's going to be a lot of people that want to know the answer to that and what this is all about. I really do. Um, okay. <laughs> this XRP, the standard produ uh, productions made me laugh out loud again. He put out another classic parody. It's parody folks, parody coil blog, David Schwartz. Here, here's David Schwartz. Uh, caught frequenting salon without a COVID mask. Um, and this is a takeoff on the Nancy Pelosi story this past week where she was in a San Francisco salon and she was caught on videotape where she wasn't wearing a mask while the salon owner was not even able to open their salon. They opened it up specially for her, but all these salon owners can't open their places. Well, David Schwartz was apparently caught frequenting the same salon without a COVID mask. And he says, I'm sorry, said Schwartz solemnly to uh, XRP Productions reporters. I wonder how XRP Productions gets access to all these people. Sorry for being set up. Those bastards told me they were allowing one person at a time without masks. I trusted them. And all of a sudden, I'm all over Fox News. Um, that's the salon owner. She's upset with him. Um, and then he, he says, from now on, says Schwartz, my cuts, colors, and perms will be at home. Thank you very much. And I saw on Twitter where Brad Garlinghouse had even liked this article. So I think they all get a kick out of what he's doing. He's doing a great job. We got to have a sense of humor in this thing, folks. Um, now, today, it started today, folks. You need to pay attention. Um, this is in the description of every video I do. Uh, the Ledger Nano S people um, have, and for those of you that don't know, the Ledger Nano S is the safest way to, it's a hard wallet for storing your digital assets so that you are in control of your private keys. Okay. Um, they started a 20% off sale today, September 7th through the 21st. It's a back to school. I'm glad we're finally getting back to school, but I wanted to show, show some of you a video um, of the Ledger that have never seen this. And again, you, there's a link to this in the description of every video I do. Um, and I will put it at the very top in this video so you can go and get your 20% off your ledger. Here's what a ledger looks like and what it does for those of you that are new to this game. If I can get the video. There. The Ledger Nano S comes in its box with a USB cable and few accessories. I think she's French. The metallic cover can be opened by a rotation and protects an OLED screen. The Nano S features two buttons on the upper side that you will press to navigate in the user interface and a micro USB port to connect. Plug it to power and use it. Press the right button to go up and the left button to go down. We've updated the software down. since then. It looks press a little different on Press both buttons simultaneously to validate. When you are done, the device can be safely powered off by unplugging the cable.
This is the safest way to store your digital assets for those of us that are just average Joes out here. So go and get one if you haven't gotten one. They're only like, I think, I don't even remember the price now, but it's like under 50 bucks, I think. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family that if they don't have the Ledger Nano S, there's 20% off in the description of all my videos. Thanks for listening. Every day, billions of people around the world are mocked, ridiculed, laughed at, and embarrassed by their friends, family, and even strangers. These people go through their days knowing there are secrets being kept from them. They hear the faint whispers behind closed doors. The information and knowledge is held very close and only shared with others who were fortunate enough to find out. Feeling lost, rejected and ostracized, these people give up, never finding out what digital assets the digital asset investor holds. But there is hope. Join the free Digital Asset Investor email newsletter and find out what digital assets he owns each month, including investments he's considering. Click the link in the description of this video or go to digitalassetinvestornewsletter.com. Put an end to your days of gloom and depression. Join the greatest free digital asset email newsletter ever created.